Yeah, I, I didn't uh, mention we're going to record your presentation and then post it to our YouTube. Okay. So it's a pleasure to have Professor Cohen with us today. Professor Cohen uh, got his master's and his PhD in uh, Komenius University in Bratislava, 2000, uh, 2000 and 2003. And then he did a series of postdocs from 2004 to 2010, most notably at the theory division in CERN uh, in Geneva and uh, the, 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 the Schrodinger Institute in uh, Vienna, in Austria. And since 2010, he's at the Institute for Theoretical Physics at the University of uh, Regensburg. And today he's going to talk to us about the uh, anisotropic vortex squeezing and, and supercurrent diode effect in non-centrocinetic Rashima superconductors. Professor Cohen, uh, thank you very much for accepting the invitation and the microphone is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, George, for a very kind introduction and I'm very happy to, to give a talk and I'm also happy to see Gerson and other people I met there. So let me start directly. Uh, so I hope you see my screen and uh, I would be happy if you stop me at any moment when I'm saying something that is not clear such that let's say we can discuss. So it's not a one-man show, so I will uh, enjoy the interaction. Okay. Okay, no problem. So very shortly, so I'm from Slovakia. Uh, let's just, let's do that. You see my pointer. Uh, so I am, I am from Bratislava. So nowadays I have a position in Bratislava, but I'm also still partly affiliated with the Regensburg. And so this is the Central European uh, region. And uh, I mainly would like to talk about these two papers today. Uh, so this is the paper uh, which we published with our experimental colleagues. And actually, both of them are the, are the works with our experimental colleagues uh, from the Regensburg. And uh, with Paolo and Andreas and Jaroslav Fabian and myself, we did some theory for that. And I would be glad to share that with you a little bit. So this is the, just the photo of the most important person. So in the first row, there are our experimental colleagues from the group of, of Professor Strunk. Uh, samples were grown by the group of uh, Michael Manfra in the Purdue University. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a photo of his group here. And the theory was the basically fruitful collaboration of Andreas, Paolo, uh, Jaroslav Fabian, I think many of you know him, uh, and, and myself. Great. So this is the introduction, or this is the outline of my talk. So uh, introduction was basically over, on, on, over done, and then I would like to just make make a very brief summary to bring us all together on a single page. And then I will tell you something about the non-centrosymmetric superconductors uh, and uh, something what is called the supercurrent diode effect, which is just the acronym of this SDI. And then I will tell you something about this Josephson effect in non-centrosymmetric uh, Josephson junctions. And uh, then I will basically slide from microscopic theory to some uh, phenomenology and tell you something about the Lifshitz invariants and, and some other, other stuff. Okay, so just very shortly, uh, I will be talking about the superconductivity. And by superconductivity, many people think uh, something as the intrinsic superconductivity, that at the beginning you are having some random electrons or electrons which are not correlated but suddenly if there is a good music, which is in that case, let's say electron phonon coupling, the electron creates a pairs and these pairs are moving coherently. Yeah? And then you are having this coherent many body ground state. And uh, basically there is a fundamental difference between the ground state uh, wave function. So in the first case, it is just the Fermi C, but in the case of BCS, it will not be important for this talk. It is some coherent superposition of, of Cooper pairs, which effectively behave as a bosons. The, the superconductivity is basically main thing. That's why I'm putting this introductory slide. The second thing I want to remind some people, especially maybe students, is that many often we can have the induced superconductivity by something what is called the proximity effect, which basically means that you take some superconductor, for example, on the, on the picture on the left, you put your material here, or basically any other realization of that, and what happened due to the quantum mechanical principles that the wave functions is is basically uh, is go going to the to, to the material. We are getting basically Cooper pairs also in the material which we want, and this is called the proximity effect. And people can compute it, uh, and, and this would be the also important in the case of my talk. 
because it will combine two, two superconducting phenomena. And the last thing which I want to just remind you is something what is called the Josephson effect. And if you are taking two pieces of superconductors, I'm just calling them in this slide as S1 and S2, you have a freedom to define uh, one parameter which has a meaning of the condensate uh, phase. And if this phase in the first conductor is not the same as the phase in the second superconductor, that what happens is that you are getting the effect which is called the Josephson current. So if that would be the insulator, the current phase relation is very, very simple. You are just having that the critical current, Js, is modulated by some function of the angle phi. Phi is this difference between uh, those two superconducting phases, and you will get the current flowing uh, between two superconductors. And this is known as the first Josephson equation. And second thing can happen is that you can still put some bias. So you can, you can take these two superconductors and put here some battery. And if you will do that, then there is a second Josephson equation, which will be also a little bit important. Is, and this tells us how the phase difference is changing uh, due to the presence of the electric field. Here, this is the second Josephson equation. And the picture is somehow like that, that the Cooper pairs are going from one to other, and basically this can transport the, the, the current of that. Just want to make a small reminder about that, that this equation is really valid only in the case when this guy is a, a total insulator, yeah? so it should be fully insulating case. In the case this is a metallic or a normal metal or, I don't know, something which has some, something which can carry the current, so three charges, then basically Josephson equation can get a little bit more complicated and it's not necessarily just the sinus of phi, but you can get also higher harmonics and things like that. Yeah? So the things can be a little bit more complicated and we will see that in our cases we will have a material which is metallic or semiconducting and, and the current phase relation will not be pure sinus. So that is just like a small warning and, and that's like that. Okay, so that was just, let's say, mainly summary. And now let me tell you very shortly uh, what are the Rajba superconductors, okay? So the best way, and I think now there's the generation when you have a questions, you normally go to chat GPT and you ask what is non-central symmetric superconductor. And actually I can tell you that, so let's say three months ago when I asked this question, chat GPT gave me complete bullshit. It was a complete crap. But I repeated it recently, and the answer is relatively decent, I would say. So if you would like to try, then I'm recommending try and put as a, as a, as a seat the non-centrosymmetric superconductors. But before that, let me tell you that people know about the non-centrosymmetric superconductors for a while, at least maybe 30 years nowadays. And I will give you, let's say, the pictorial definition. What is it? So there are several good reviews about the non-centrosymmetric superconductors. I'm just, uh, let's say, showing this uh, book about the non symmetric superconductors uh, by uh, Ernst Bauer and Manfred Sigrist. This is the collections of the articles uh, from some conference, but those articles are really very good, so one can also learn something from that. There is a very nice review from the group of Daniel Achterberg about that, so also, uh, let's say, pleasant reading for someone who would like to know more. And now, let's say, simple definition. So non symmetric superconductors are effectively quasi-2D or unidirectionally anisotropic 3D system. So this is uh, one characteristic definition. They behave as a superconductors. So it means there should be present Meissner effect and there should be a zero resistance. And these materials has a property that the Fermi surface is spin split due to spin orbit coupling. And this is important. So the spin orbit coupling plays a role which splits the Fermi surface. And you need to be in the regime when the spin orbit coupling energy is dominating over all other smaller energy scales, like the superconducting gap, Zeeman energy, exchange energy, and everything and everything. Of course, Fermi energy is the highest energy scale, but the next one is, is the spin orbit coupling. And basically, to get this uh, anisotropy or, or this uh, Fermi split surface, basically, you need a material which breaks uh, uh, space inversion symmetry. Yeah? So if you have materials, for example, like the niobium diselenide, this niobium diselenide does not have the inversion symmetry, and because as a consequence of that you are having the Fermi surface, which I'm just plotting here, and this Fermi surface has spin split uh, uh, two contours, and basically this is the necessary ingredient to get the, to get this, uh, to get the uh, non symmetric superconductors. 
Okay, so just a little bit in terms of some Hamiltonian and some picture. So we are having like single particle Hamiltonian, which I'm ju just denoting by H0, which has the standard dispersion. So this was uh, the non-splitting part, so let's say kinetic, kinetic term. Then you are having the Rajba interaction. And if you look for the Fermi surface, this is what I was telling you that this broken space inversion symmetry, which, uh, which allows this uh, uh, non-central symmetric term in the, in the single particle Hamiltonian is giving us this uh, spin split Fermi surface. The important ingredient uh, for the further experimental things, which you will see is the in-plane magnetic field, B. And this in-plane magnetic field couple just to the spin degrees of freedom. So it means that, you know, like if you apply the magnetic field, then let's say one spin configuration uh, has the lower energy, another has the raised energy. And basically what happens in this picture is that this smaller circle is moving, let's say, for example, to the right. And this larger single is, uh, circle is moving to the left. And taking the time reversal symmetry broken stuff, you are getting the Fermi surface, which is, which is basically distorted. Yeah, and you see how it is distorted. It's always perpendicular to the to the in-plane magnetic field, assuming that this is not a tensor, this is just the scalar. But of course, if you have a G factor, which is anisotropic, yeah, of course, you can get a different response of that. And the last thing are the superconducting correlations. And here it is important that the superconducting pairing is appearing just between the circles. Yeah? So the electrons here are creating the Cooper pairs and the electron here are creating the Cooper pair. So, so this is the important ingredient. And this is this superconducting pairing is called the non-central symmetric superconductors. If this is happening, yeah. So this is let's say the definition of of what is it. And it can be shown. And I will just very quick argument below that if this is the case, then the condensate wave function. So this is the superconductor superconducting wave function, which describe the Cooper pairs, is now getting modulated, and you are getting the plane wave modulation. And this plane wave modulation Q is the vector which is proportional to the G factor. G factor is hidden somewhere here in the in the in, in this expression. Then there is the in-plane magnetic field. There is the Rajba interaction, and Z is this direction. And so I'm assuming that my superconductor uh, has the uh, unipolar direction which is pointing along the z-axis. So you see that larger the Rajba or larger the magnetic field or larger G factor you're getting the more pronounced spatial modulation of the, of the order parameter. And I will tell you later why this is important and what is the experimental consequence of that. Okay, so just to very quickly, the realization which our experimental colleagues are doing is given by that. So they are considering the two deck. This two deck is living in the indium arsenide uh, quantum well. And this two deck is proximitized by the aluminum. So aluminum is a superconductor. It's a very thin aluminum. And then there is a proximity effect which basically proximitizes this two deck due to the superconducting aluminum. And then our experimental colleagues are applying this in-plane magnetic field. So basically, yeah, they are able to play with the polarity angle. So they are able to change the angle of this field and they are able to change the magnitude of this field. So this is exactly the the situation which, which basically somehow like corresponds to the picture which I was telling you that this thing is behaving effectively as a superconductor due to the proximity effect. This two deck is behaving as a superconductor and it can be shown that this superconductor is really modulated or basically the Cooper wave functions like that. I, I cannot go deeper to the theory. Uh, people who are interested can follow the books which I was referring for, but this is let's say the cartoon picture which is good to uh, have in mind uh, if you would like to understand it a little bit more microscopically. So far, so good. May I go on? Yes. Great. So yeah, no, no questions. Okay, just very quickly, why this is so? So, uh, okay, this inner contour does not play the important role at all because uh, the density of states due to the Rajba is suppressed. So you are seeing, uh, so I'm just showing you, this is the dispersion. If you solve this Hamiltonian, which I show you the single particle Hamiltonian, you will exactly see these two uh, shifted uh, concentric circles, circles uh, which are shifted uh, a little bit. And basically this circle does not play a role for two reasons. First of all, due to the strong Rajba, uh, there is a different density of states for the, for the electrons living on this Fermi circle compared to this Fermi circle. 
uh, which, is, which is basically given by the ratio of the Rajba to the Fermi velocity. And then the critical temperature is basically inversely proportional to the density of states. So basically, someone who has larger density of states would have a higher critical temperature and the superconductivity will upper the first. And the second thing is also the, the screening. Yeah, you see the two electrons which are lying here on these two circles, they are, they are separated by the momentum capital K. And if you just take the very simple uh, uh, Fermi Thomas screening, you see that they will feel much weaker interaction. So it's much easier for them to, to make the Cooper pairs as the electrons which are lying here and the separation vector K is much smaller. So this value which will be much larger. So this is really, please take it as a very small wave handing argument why this uh, uh, order parameter is now having a spatial variation. And, and this, this shift of, this, of, this, of the circle from the gamma point is basically this vector Q, which I was describing you here and it's appearing like here. So this is, let's say the very simple, very simple picture one, one can have in mind about that. I know that it's not uh, easy to grasp everything what I was telling you. Uh, of course, you can believe me or not believe me, or you can study more. I would be happy to answer the questions later, but you will see that this will not be so much important what I will tell you later. This is just to tell you that there is some nice theory behind that and we can go on. So now I'm coming to the supercurrent diode effect. And uh, I just would like to tell you what the supercurrent diode effect is. And the situation is like that. So if you are having a superconductor, and you start to run a current over the superconductor, you will see that if you are gradually increasing the current, you are killing the superconductivity. Yeah? Some Cooper pairs are splitting to the free electrons. Still, some of them survive. And you use even larger current, you split even more Cooper pairs. And there is actually the critical current when basically all Cooper pairs are dissociated because energetically it's not favorable for the superconductor to stay in the superconducting case. And this is the typical picture which you know from the textbooks. Yes, so I was showing you that we were increasing the current. There was not necessary to create any voltage. And suddenly there was a critical current when system jumps and start to respect, let's say, the Ohm's law or something like that. Or in the case of the resistance or resistivity, you can see that basically you are starting in the non-resistive states. And then suddenly, okay, the, here it is described as a ratio of the critical current. Suddenly at the critical current, there is onset of the resistance and okay, so in this picture, it's basically plotted like here, but in reality, of course, it, it, the, the curve is not a, it's not a line perpendicular to the x-axis, uh, parallel to the x-axis, yes, so it has, some, it has some, some dynamics of that. Okay, so this is the standard thing which is valid for all superconductors. But what can happen in the superconducting diode effect is that you can see that the critical current in one direction is larger than the critical current in the other direction. Yeah? So in principle, they know that they are not necessarily to be equal. And it's easy to understand from the picture that, of course, if I have a, if I have a distorted Fermi surface, as I was telling you, so we are applying the in-plane magnetic field, we are changing in the normal states the Fermi surface. So you see that, of course, I have, I have more charge carriers, let's say, in this direction that in this direction and basically very classically one can really okay say okay I, I am seeing from this picture let's say this would be the standard uh, Raj by Edelstein effect or something like that that you would say okay classically I am somehow understanding that there is a prevalence of, of, of the current in this direction but what comes out that by changing the polarity of this magnetic field yeah you can move these two circles and then you would expect that those two pictures will change yeah so you can switch the critical currents or the magnitudes of the critical currents by changing the polarity of the input magnetic field. And this is not only the expectation, this is the experimental fact. Okay, this is just the formula, how the critical current depends on the direction of the magnetic field, uh, direction of the current and some coefficient. And this is a typical relation, which is called the magnetochiral uh, formula, because you see that the polarity of the magnetic field and the current uh, defines which, which critical current is larger. So people did the experiments, and I'm just showing the first experiment which was done in the Japan. So they really take different superconductors, these niobium, tantal, vanadium, etc. They create a stack of that, and then they really apply the in-plane magnetic field in one direction and in the opposite direction, and they were driving the current and also in one direction and another direction. And this is the picture, I will show it later, and they are seeing the critical current as a function of the in-plane magnetic field. This is the polarity of the in-plane magnetic field. 
And they were the first to see that critical current in one direction, let's say this is the blue line, is larger than the critical current as the green line. Yeah, and the, the, this was the measurement which was done in the case of the, of the thin superconducting film. The group in the Regensburg was the one who, who repeated the same, or the uh, conceptually experiment is a different. Instead of the film, you are having the arrays of the Josephson junctions. Yeah? So this is now the physics of the Josephson junctions, which I was slightly describing in this uh, taking off slide. And they do the, exactly the same thing. So the Josephson junction is proximitizing the two deck. This is this uh, niobium uh, indium arsenide, which I showed you before, which has a strong spin orbit coupling and strong G factor. And again, by applying the in-plane magnetic field in one direction or in another direction, they were able to see asymmetry in the current phase relation. Okay, so this is the current phase relation. And they will see that the critical current in one direction is larger than the critical current in the other direction. Okay, so this is, again, the manifestation of the same, same phenomenon. Even the effect was uh, observed in other materials, for example, creating the uh, Dirac semi-metal Josephson junction. And again, this is the, this is the uh, results from the group of uh, Stuart Parkins, and they are also nicely, clearly seeing that there is a, uh, there is a uh, supercurrent diode effect, that the critical current in one direction is different than the critical current in another direction. There are many other experiments uh, showing these things, and uh, it comes to the conclusion that really the important ingredient to see this effect is to have a spin-orbit coupling which breaks the, uh, which is due to the break of the parity or the, or the uh, sp space inversion symmetry and the in-plane magnetic field, which is able to switch the functionality of that. So the meaning would be like that, for example, that in one direction, you will be still able to transport the supercurrent, but on the other direction, you will already get the, the dissipative current. Yeah? So this is why it's called the superconducting diode effect that in one direction, you still can have a Cooper pairs flying, but in the other direction, you will just have a normal electrons flying. So this is the, this is somehow the etymology of the word superconducting diode effect. Okay, this is this picture which I was telling you, uh, which I was telling you before. So the effect is very small in the uh, superconducting films. This is also because the temperature uh, was too high, because to measure such things, you need to still be in the resistive response. I will tell it uh, a little bit later. But if the temperature is going down, this difference is getting uh, larger. Yeah? So the supercurrent diode effect is sensitive to the temperature. Good. Immediately after that, there appears a plenty of theory papers. Just, just look for here. So that was the 3rd of the June, 7th of the June, 7th of the June. And then the later, I don't know, these, these were somewhere in the uh, proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences. This went somewhere to PRL. This was just somewhere smaller. But there were many other theory uh, proposals, including in the papers which I will cite, which is the, from the group of the Regensburg. We also are part of the experiments. We are also providing the theory, which I will tell you in, in a moment. Yeah? But OK, our papers are more, mainly considered as experimental papers, but also, we are having some glimpses of, uh, coming, to the, coming to the theory. Also, we are having some, uh, let's say, new acquisition uh, just from the March uh, uh, this year. So we are having some microscopic Hamiltonian, which I will share with you today. But we are also having some phenomenological approach, which I will then also try to, try to highlight. So let's say this is a little bit showing off from my side that I am showing the, uh, our own results. And just to tell you an important thing, that at 4 point Kelvin, so these measurements of this critical current was done basically roughly in this region of the current voltage diagram. And then there is a natural question what would happen here. And one can see that it's not so easy to measure the response here because you don't have any resistive response. Yeah? So resistivity is almost zero or directly zero, and there is necessity to do something different. And what different, this was not clear to me, but my experimental colleagues came with a beautiful idea that, as I told you, so they consider Josephson junction, so the system is slightly different. So you are having an array of the Josephson junctions. So this is the, this is the let's say, the side view. So you are having this two deck. This two deck is proximitized by aluminum, and then you are having a spacer which is not super And they made an array which has roughly 2,000 of these islands. So there were the, uh, so the number of the Josephson junction was like, its number is here, it was 2,000. Uh, Josephson junctions, and instead of the resistive response, they measured something what is called the inductive response. 
And uh, so they measure the Josephson inductance. So they consider the system, they drive it by the AC current, and they were able to get some AC response of the of the of the superconducting condensate, which can be uh, attributed to the inductance. And this allows for a beautiful thing. And for this, I was showing you these two first uh, equations. So inductance, by definition, is defined as a voltage divided by the change of the uh, of the of the current with the time. And if you are using the uh, uh, Josephson equation or basically if you differentiate this so you are using the current phase relation so you don't know the current phase relation in the simplest case i told you it's a sinus but in general it's some complicated function so you can express this derivative as a derivative of the of the angle or the phase difference then you can use the second josephson equation which i was telling you and you can transform this formula uh, so this is the flux quantum so this is just the fundamental constant this is 2pi and basically you can see that the inductance is nothing else as the derivative of the of the superconducting phase difference with, with respect to the current. And now you can integrate this equation. Let's say this is the experimentally given data, so you know them. This is the differential equation which you solve. And now you can get the phase difference as a function of the current. And if you would be able to invert that, you will get the current phase relation. And the current phase relation is a typical quantity which theorists are able to compute yeah? so this is the current phase relation and normally we are able if someone is telling you what is the Hamiltonian what is the system we are able to compute that so this is the beautiful connection that measuring the inductance we can unhide and we can specify what is the current phase relation yeah? so uh, this is the beautiful thing just coming from this very simple Josephson equations and this is the main thing which connects our theoretical approach because we are computing the critical currents with the experimentalists which are measuring the, the Josephson inductance. Okay, just very quickly, so how to compute the, the critical currents. So there are many ways how to do it. I just pick up the, the let's say, the paper which I like uh, mostly. This is this paper by uh, Kulik and he's discussing, oh, I will close the window because there is some summer fest here. So, there are many ways how to compute it. So, either you compute the free energy or you, co or you compute the Green's function and there is basically formulas how to do it. And basically what you need is, depends whom you ask, so if you will ask the John Lennon, he will say you need a laugh. If you will ask, uh, let's say, Karl Marx, he, he said you need a capital. If you said Sigmund Freud, he would say sex. I would say you need a Hamiltonian. And if you have a Hamiltonian, basically the picture is very simple. So you have a one superconductor, and since it's a superconductor, the, the, the quasi-particle excitation are having a gap. In the middle, you are having the normal metal. In the normal metal, the excitations are gapless. In another superconductor, it's also uh, uh, gapped. And then if you just basically look for the wave functions, the wave function which is living here will be evanescent. Yeah? So it, it will have some tail which is propagating towards the superconductor. And because you are having a different superconducting phases, this wave function is a complex wave function. So if you will compute the probability current or the, uh, let's say, electric current, then you will see it's non-zero because the wave function, wave, wave function is a complex. And basically, this is the reason uh, for the Josephson, uh, for, for the Andreev reflection. Yeah, so I, I assume that some people know that. So this is just a very simple reason that these localized states are able to propagate the Cooper pairs and transform them from one side to the other side, creating this Josephson current, which we are computing. So this is the, this is the let's say, theory side. So always having a Hamiltonian, our task is to compute the, the, the critical current. Okay, so what our experimental colleague observed, and this is the things which start to be interesting. So as I told you, they are having the Josephson junction, and now they are playing with the in-plane magnetic field, but they are changing the orientation of the in-plane magnetic field. So this angle theta is in this case the angle which is going either in this direction, and then it becomes perpendicular, anti-opposite, uh, anti and perpendicular in the other stuff, yeah? And then they are measuring this inductance. And surprisingly, they are seeing that <clears throat> inductance <clears throat> for the direction which is pointing in the zero angle or in 180 angles is the same. So this is the experimental data 
of the inductance in, in the, in the nano-Henry regime. <clears throat> for some intermediate angle, they are si slightly seeing that, let's say, 45 degrees and 315 degrees are behaving differently. And this curve starts to be split. Yeah? Somehow we are seeing that the inductance uh, for one value of the current bias is larger than the inductance in the otherwise, but however, it's switched for the opposite current biases. Yeah? So they are changing, the, the, they are putting the AC current and they are able to measure it. And the maximum of that is appearing when the magnetic field is perfectly in plane to the current direction. Yeah? Just to tell you, current is always flying in this direction. And now we are perpendicular to this, to this current direction and the data are plotted here. So basically, they just take the very simple formula, as I showed you before, but instead of the current, they are now using the Josephson inductance. And so they are assuming that the total inductance as a function of the current bias is some constant, and there is some term which depends on the product of the in-plane magnetic field and the current direction. And they clearly see it from the data that it should be like that. So they just take this uh, relation, expand it around the zero bias, and they are able to extract these coefficients, lambda zero, they call it, for some reasons, uh, which I am not sure why they call it like that, they call it this coefficient lambda zero, uh, which is clear, and then they are having some prime coefficient, which is proportional to the current, and the second prime, which is proportional to the, to the current square, and they are able to extract those, all those coefficients, and uh, this is the data which they are having, which clearly shows that we are having a beautiful sinus sinus relation. And so for different angles, you are having the ratio, and they plot the ratio of those two because then you can read off some, some material parameters which, which, let's say, you don't know or you don't want to know uh, at the moment. So you get some, some quantity which is independent of some uh, intrinsic uh, parameters of the junctions. So they, they, they display this two ratio of those two things, and they are clearly seeing it's a beautiful sinusoidal function, yeah? so, so these coefficients really behave like that. And that was a puzzling, and then was the time when uh, they approaches us and they want to understand what we are doing. And we took the most simplest Hamiltonian, which we can say, so I said all you need is a Hamiltonian, so we considered the most simple Hamiltonian, so this is the junction which we considered, so it has the electron and hole part, then there is a superconducting phase difference delta, so we consider that superconductivity here and here are the same in the magnitude, but they are having a different uh, angle phi. And then we consider that uh, we are having the Rajba interaction. So Rajba was everywhere. Then we apply the in-plane magnetic field, which couples with the effective G factor to the electrons. We also use some confinement potential because we model it as, as, a, as a 3D system. And so the electrons uh, we confined in this quantum well, so there was some con confinement. We even try to simulate the situation when the barriers are not transparent. So there was these parameters dB, which somehow tells you that, okay, you don't have the ideal barrier. And Paolo helped us a lot because for such kind of junctions, which are based on the indium, arsenum, indium uh, arsenide and indium gallium arsenide, he was able to specify for us the concentration of the charge carriers depending on the voltage and also extract the value of the Rajba and effective mass and the G factors. So these numbers, were basically computed by Pablo, and they are the parameters which enters our phenomenological Hamiltonian. That time, we just take the Hamiltonian, do the brute force, so Hamiltonian was implemented into the quant, and basically, we were able, and this is the theoretical data, so these solid lines, these black lines, so we were able to adjust, and there was only one adjusting parameter, and the adjusting parameter was the confinement potential, so we were able to find the confinement potential such that we were beautifully, uh, let's say beautifully, we were able to decently reproduce the experimental data. There are some deviations which I will explain in a moment later. So that was the tour de force in terms like, okay, you take the Hamiltonian, you feed the program, you press the enter, you place with the parameters and you try to uh, get the experimental data. Once more, I'm telling you, we computed just to, so we computed this thing, so this was the things which we were computing, and to convert it to the inductance, we were using this formula. Yeah? So we, we are going basically inverse engineering. So to compare it, we were doing it like that. Okay, so this was how we did it. And then later on, we tried to still try to find some analytical model, which would be able to explain the experimental data even, even better. And what we did was that we, uh, this was just the work with Andreas, uh, Yaro, and myself, 
So basically, we just uh, take this complicated stuff, we just really take it as a 2D. So it was really two the reduction. And even of that spacer, we just consider that this is a delta function region. And we just consider that the Rajba is everywhere. Magnetic field is only here. And we just take a very simple model, which has, however, because it has a finite width, so it has a many transverse channels which can transport the Cooper pair. So the calculation should be taken into account the width of, of the system. And we were really able to solve this model analytically. Of course, at the end, you need to always use some mathematica to plot the data. But the formulas can be, can be really nicely computed. And we were able to really compute the, the current phase relation inductance Josephson energies. And this is the things which we are having a qualitative, not only qualitative, even a quantitative agreement with the experiments. So for example, this coefficients L0 as a function of the in-plane magnetic field is showing some shoulders or some, some king here. And we are able to somehow see it from this very simple model that there is a, some, some king appearing here. Then they are seeing that this coefficient L0 prime is suddenly changing the uh, sign. And it was also unclear why this coefficient should uh, change the sign. And this model allows us to explain that because what happened is in this junction appears something what is called a zero pi transition and uh, many other things. So also the uh, critical current uh, and the difference in the critical current. So basically this model, despite it's very simple, is able to qualitatively very good uh, reproduce the experimental data of the, of the Josephson junction. So uh, we were very happy and we were also very lucky. So we again collaborated with the same group of experimentalists so there is a paper which is on the archive, if you are interested. And uh, recently it was again also accepted to the Nature Nanotechnology. The important reason was that it was not easy to explain this change of the, of the inductance from plus to the minus. And we explained it. And the main point behind that is the something what is called zero pi transitions. Let's say for the experts, they probably know. And for non-experts, it would be a little bit difficult to explain it on, 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 just now. So basically, we think and we have a hypothesis which was uh, also successfully uh, tested in the other uh, samples that really this change of the magneto inductance is somehow really related to the zero pi transitions uh, which can appear in the system. So we are having, let's say, some another uh, independent, uh, independent technique how to, how to detect the uh, zero pi transition appearing in the, of the system. So it would, be the sec uh, it would be the first derivative of the inductance and the sign of that. Okay. So that was the first thing. And now I am sliding to the phenomenology. If you don't have a question still now, I will uh, slide to the phenomenology and I will tell you something, uh, something different. May I go on? Uh, no questions. Great. So hopefully you are still with me and uh, I can still have, let's say two or let's say not two, maybe 10 minutes and I will be done. Yeah, if, you are, if you will be interested, I can be even more, but I just want to tell you about the phenomenology because I especially very like this uh, mem, which shows that uh, you have this BCS theory, uh, uh, which has uh, many, many things uh, you need to assume. And especially Horst is always uh, complaining about the BCS theory and comes with, a, with, a, uh, with a, uh, let's say, improvements. And there is this uh, beautiful ginzburg lambda theory, which is effectively some mean field theory of the second order phase transition. And with that, you can surprisingly, with few phenomenological parameters, you can explain the many, many uh, things. Yeah? And I will try to show you. And the main point is, for those who maybe know, is that there is a way that you start with a microscopic Hamiltonian, let's say with the interacting one, and there is a procedure, let's say we have a uh, path integral or I don't know, using the, uh, using the coarse graining techniques that you can come from the microscopic Hamiltonian to the phenomenological free energy, which just depends on some order parameter, which is in this case, the Cooper pair wave function. You have the in-plane magnetic field, or you have the, some magnetic field if you do the things in the, in the magnetic field and the temperature. And I just want to tell you that, okay, first guy who did it seriously was a Gorkov. And many people just follow this uh, Gorkov, Gorkov idea, how to start it from the, from the Ginzburg-Landau, uh, from the bogolubov degen equations, for example, how to derive the uh, Ginzburg-Landau equation. So this is, this is the picture. And just to just tell you that I'm talking about the Lifshitz invariant. 
And I just want to tell you that the nature was so kind to us as a human beings because it gives us the Lifshitz in two isotopes. There is the older brother called Yevgeny Lifshitz and there is a younger brother called Ilya Lifshitz. And both of them are famous. Like, uh, let's say the first one is known from the Landa Lifshitz Gilbert equation. So this is that guy, the older brother. Then there is a, something like Landa Lifshitz model, then something in the cosmology called Belinsky Kalatnikov Lifshitz singularity. But mainly, uh, the, this Lifshitz is famous for something of what is called the Course of Theoretical Physics, which is the 10 books uh, written together with uh, Landau. However, the other brother is also famous in the condensed matter physics for some, uh, some works in the disordered systems, something what is called the Lifshitz tail or Lifshitz exponents. Then there is a very important formula, and I think Gerson would know it because last time when we met, we discussed it. So this is the lifshitz kosovich formula. This belongs to that brother. And both of them are having something called a Lifshitz transition. So this belongs to the younger brother, and there is the Lifshitz invariant, and this is the things which belongs to the older brother. So this is just, let's say, to have some historical note. And the important thing is that both of them were the PhD students of the Landau. This is the photo of London from 1936 when he was in a jail. And uh, because of the intervention of Kapitza, he survived. But uh, you see that this is a photo which yeah, I don't want to be in that position. But I'm just saying that a part of they were brothers, they at the same time were PhD students of Landa. Okay, and uh, what is this Lipschitz invariant? I will just very briefly say you. So if you will repeat the Gorkov trick, how to, starting from the microscopic Hamiltonian, you can get the free energy. And this trick was first done by the uh, Edelstein. So this is the photo of the Edelstein. You will derive the ginzburg landau free energy. So this is the Landau term. This is the Ginzburg term. But what comes out, if you want or don't want, you are getting the term, which is strange, because it is linear in the derivative. Oh, so this D is the covariant derivative. So it's a normal derivative plus the vector potential. So it's linear in the derivative, but it's a quadratic in the order parameter. And the coefficient kappa, which is here, one can show following the calculation, that basically it knows the, about the Rajba interaction, G factor, and, and the Fermi velocity. And so all those things are coming into this constant kappa. So if you would not have a Rajba interaction, or you will not have a G factor, this term would be zero. But however, if they are non-zero, you, you cannot avoid that. And this term is called the Lifshitz invariant because Lifshitz did something much, much earlier, and he was proposing that such term can always be added to the free energy. As I was telling you that the first guy who did it systematically was Edelstein, and this is the paper, if you would like to know more. And, uh, and Edelstein shows something more. He, he does not only show that, or he didn't only show that uh, you can derive the generalized uh, free energy, but he even showed that you can get this supercurrent diode effect, that the critical current in one direction should be different than the critical current in the other direction. Okay, and uh, let me just skip that. And let me just tell you what is the Lifshitz invariant. Consider it is a very nice thing, and I hope that you will later also maybe appreciate it because you will see that you know it. So according to simplest theory of the phase transition, second order phase transition due to the Landau, which can be attributed just to the following uh, quadratic and b-quadratic. Uh, Landa was putting a very simple argument saying like, if this coefficient will change a sign from the positive to the negative or from the negative to the positive, what would happen is that the order parameter will change its value from the minimum, which is non-zero to the minimum, which is a zero. And he interpreted this change uh, as, a, as, a, as a phase transition. So you are going from the more ordered states when the order parameter is zero to some lower ordered state when the order parameter is not zero. And I'm just schematically describing that like this. Yeah? So let's say in the high symmetric state, the order parameter has a certain value. It's, it's not necessarily zero, but okay, I'm plotting it like that. And in the low symmetric case, the order of par parameter has the lower symmetry. So you clearly see that, okay, here is a circular symmetry. Here is some broken symmetry. So Landau did it uh, basically when he came out from the, from, the, from the prison. And what did the Lifshitz? He was trying to refine the Landau's arguments. So you see that Landau published in 1937 and Lifshitz published in 1940. And he tried to refine this argument and he was trying to refine the uh, Landau arguments and saying, oh, let us look for terms which are still quadratic but linear in the gradients. 
And he was just showing, just purely expanding the free energy in terms of, of, of psi and gradient of psi, that there are not any symmetric constraints or time reversal symmetric constraints or something like that, which would prevent the existence of such term, which is exactly the term I showed you before. So quadratic in psi, linear in the gradient, and there will be some coefficients phenomenological chi L, and this is called the Lifshitz invariant. And what this Lifshitz invariant is doing is that he, it's saying is that the transition from the high symmetric state to the low symmetric state can happen like that, that there is a modulation on a large scale, yeah? So it's not like before that all those, let's say, uh, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five pentagons were beautifully parallel to each other, but now you see they can change in the space. And the changing in the space is characterized by this kappa L, which is this Lifshitz term. Okay, so this is the second order phase transitions with the spatial modulations. And people classify, all, and this is the things from the group theory. So just looking for the group theory and the representations, you can see which point group would have the Lifshitz invariant and even how it will look like. So, so this is from this uh, review paper of the Achtenberg, which I was showing you, you before. So basically, there is a procedure how from the representations, irreducible representations, you can compute whether the given point group would have the Lifshitz invariant or would not have a Lifshitz invariant. And if you remember the uh, life of the Brian, you maybe remember the scene when they are discussing and they are saying, what has the Romans ever done for us? And uh, I can just ask uh, the similar question, what has the Lifshitz invariant ever done for us? I just will tell you that in the chiral magnets, Many of you maybe know something about the jaloshinsky moria interaction. And the story is like that, that Jaloshinsky was reading the paper of the Lifshitz, and he immediately came with the idea that the free energy of the magnetic system, now M is the magnetization, can also be expressed in the following way. So it's a quadratic in M, and the linear in the first derivative, but because Lifshitz considered 2D systems and he considered 3D systems, so he need to take the vector product. And basically, this term is responsible that now we can have a skirmions, yeah? So this is, again, the texture which is changing spatially in the space. And the reason for that is the presence of this, of this uh, Lifshitz invariant, which is called, okay, in that case, jaloshinsky moria interaction. People doing uh, the liquid crystals, they know that there is some also famous uh, free energy, which is called frank Ossen free energy. And this is also the term in, this, in that case for, uh, for the liquid crystal, and is the director field. Yeah, and you can again see that you are having a term which is quadratic in N and linear in the gradient, and this term is responsible that you can have a liquid crystals, which are basically changing the shape over the space. And as I was telling you, the, from the work of the Edelstein, we know that the same effect can happen in the superconductivity because you can have, you can have the, this term. So, okay, I am sure that uh, many people uh, there knows about this term, and this is just a very special case of the, of the Lifshitz invariant for the magnetic systems. Okay, so what I did, or what we did, was that we take this generalized Ginsburg-Landau Lifshitz free energy with all those three terms. Uh, by the way, this term was added by the Ginsburg later. Eh? So all this is a static. So the Lifshitz term plus the Landau term are static. Eh? So you are having the modulation in space, but this modulation is not dynamical. It's, the, it's a st standing modulation. Only if you add this uh, Ginsburg term, yeah, you can start to have some, some dynamics of the order parameter. So what we did, we just take this theory, okay, because of the time, I'm just maybe just telling you that this generalized theory has uh, three length scales. So the standard ginsburg landa theory, you are always having the coherence length and the penetration length. But because of this term, you can also create some new coherence length, which is called the Lifshitz length, and this is the length over which the order parameter is changing the phase in the space. So it is something what, what tell me the, how the phase is changing. And if you remember, basically this thing can be interpreted as the, as the manifestation of the Lifshitz invariant. This change of the phase of the order parameter, which is now modulated, can be exactly connected with, with, with these things. Okay, so in this paper, we very carefully studied this ginsburg landau lifshitz free energy, and we were able to show that purely on the phenomenological level, one can express the supercurrent diode effect. So this is the current phase relation. So you see it's asymmetric, and if we are plotting the ratio, we are able to, okay, the difference between critical current in one direction and the critical current in another direction, we are seeing that it's different. 
However, if you have phenomenology, you have the access to express the things in, in terms of the quantities, like the thickness of the film and the, the uh, penetration depth. And, and Rajba is hidden here. So there is some formula which relates one over lambda to the Rajba. So one over lambda is proportional to the Rajba interaction. So when Rajba is zero, this effectively means that this L is infinite and then you don't have the effect. So you really need the in-plane magnetic field and, and, the, and the Rajba. So in-plane magnetic field is hidden in this B0. So, so this, is the, this is the things. And do I still have a time or you think uh, it's maybe time to stop? Uh, 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes. Oh, that's yeah. great. Then I can just tell you what we did. So again, the story was uh, a little bit different. So our experimental colleagues, they start to take the same material as I showed you before. So it was this indium arsenide uh, proximitized by aluminium. But now they didn't take the uh, Josephson junctions. They just take this material and just then they just make the meander. It was a big meander which has a large linear scale. It was, I don't know, maybe up to centimeters length. Then again, start to play with the in-plane magnetic field. Yeah, so they apply the in-plane magnetic field and they were able to change it by the angle theta. Then they start to drive the system by the, uh, by the AC current with given frequency. And moreover, they apply the out-of-plane magnetic field in this case. And they created the pinned abricoso vortices. Yeah? So if you take the superconductor of type 2, and for quasi 2D superconductors, all superconductors are effectively uh, type 2. Basically, they get the abricoso vortices, and they were able to measure the inductance of the abricoso vortex. And that, is, that, that I will try to explain you shortly that abricoso vortices, if they are moving, their response can be detected as the inductive response. And they did it. And uh, just let me explain you why the vortex is behaving as an inductor. So if you are imagine the vortex, so the vortex is like that, that the magnetic field is going here. And then there is a screening current which compensates the vortex because you need to have fluxoid quantization or something like that. So there is some screening current which is flowing around the vortex. Now, if you start to drive the AC current, yeah, this is this AC current which we are using, what happens is that in that side of the vortex, the screening current plus the AC current add coherently. And on that case, they are acting against each other. So the screening current times the external current is smaller here. Yeah? So you are basically having that in that case, the fluid, some fluid or condensate is moving with a higher velocity. And on that case is, is moving with a slower velocity. Which immediately tells you that, okay, you have a condensate within this movie, and this means there would be something like a, uh, like a Bernoulli force, or this is not, in that case, it's called the Lorentz force, because basically just as using just simple electro or hydrodynamics, so you are having a smaller, smaller velocity, which means you should have a higher pressure of the condensate from that side compared to that side. You will see that the vortex will move in this direction. This would be the case if the vortex would be free. But our vortices are not free, they are pinned. So you have some impurity, or you have some crack, or you have some, some problem there. And what happens is that the vortex is pinned, so it is able to move, but it's, his potential energy is growing. And at some point, it's, it cannot go on, and then it starts to pin. So, the, so, the, uh, so there is, in this pinning potential, the vortex will move around this, uh, around this pinning center. And this force which is acting on that is normally always approximated by the quadratic potential. So the, this, this potential L uh, in the vortex, which is moving, is always quadratic potential. And the coefficients here, for some reasons, are related to the second derivative of the order parameters in the middle. So if you would be able to compute it, this psi, which is computed here, you will take the psi square, and you will compute the second derivative of that. So there are the coefficients of this quadratic potential. And the last force, which is here, is the, uh, so these two forces are here. And the last force, which is here, is that if the vortex is moving, inside of that there are electrons, outside are the Cooper pairs. So the when the electron is moving or the vortex is moving, it should dissociate the Cooper pairs to electron and re re reassociate them, which basically means that there is some viscous force which is proportional to the velocity of that. Yeah, so we see that this force depends on the R radius from the center. This force depends on the velocity of the vortex, and this force depends on the on the Lorentz force depends on the external current which is driven always as a, as a as a yeah, harmonic uh, harmonic function 
And if you solve the basic equations for that, just the purely classical equations, object which is moving under the, pre, uh, under the presence of the total force, you are having three force turns. Basically, you can solve this equation. It's basically driven uh, harmonic oscillator. However, for the vortex, this mass term is zero, or it's almost zero. You can really imagine it as this uh, 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 level weight. Yeah, basically, the vortex, you can imagine it's like the bubble, and around you are having a condensate from the Cooper pairs. So basically, there is not any, any uh, uh, inertia force. So it's even simpler to solve such equation. And if you will solve it, then you will see that if the current is going in this direction, vortex is moving in this direction. And if you change, it's basically respond, but the response is purely inductive. Yeah, and I just want to tell you that uh, the, the, the amplitude of the current and the amplitude of that are shifted by 90 degrees. So this is the reason why you have it inductive. And you should keep in mind that since the vortex is carrying the in -plane, uh, the out-of-plane magnetic field, and if you are moving the magnetic field, you are getting the electromotive force, and then you can get some, uh, some impedance. And this impedance can be really computed. It's very simple equations. And you will really compute this impedance as the electromotive force divided by the driving current. You will use the solutions of the equations of motions, which I saw on the previous slides. So you really solve these equations. So you compute the velocity. You plug everything there and you really get this inductive response that the impedance is basically minus E times some coefficient. And this coefficient is called the, the inductance of the single vortex. If you have more vortices than the inductance, in that case, should be multiplied by the number of vortices effectively. And the formula is telling you that the inductance is proportional to the magnetic field, flux quantum, this is the fundamental constant, and there is this K, and K always is the, is the, is this Kx or Ky, which component which is always perpendicular to the current. So if the current is in the x direction, then the K uh, perpendicular is Ky. If the current is in the y direction, then it's kx. Yeah? So this k is always perpendicular to the current. And now this was a big surprise, because what you would naively expect is that if you look for the experimental data, uh, this was still not the surprise. So if you look for the experimental data, this formula really makes this, the, the, the sense. So I'm just showing you the experimental data. So first of all, they didn't have any in-plane magnetic field. So there is not in-plane magnetic field yet. And what they are doing is they are using the, they are increasing the out-of-plane magnetic field by Z. And you are seeing that for certain range of, in -plane, of the out-of-plane magnetic field, the increase of the inductance is purely linear, if you, is, as, you would, would, as you would expect, because there is this dependence on the Z. Of course, there is the departure from the linearity, because at the higher magnetic field, you are creating more and more vortices, and then the vortices are interacting. Yeah? So there are still other forces which were not accounted in, 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 in deriving this formula. So we just really consider single vortex which is moving. But then you can have vortex-vortex interactions, and this is responsible for, for, for this shoot-up here. Okay, but this linear increase of the inductance is really proportional to this thing. The second thing was that, again, in-plane magnetic field was zero. They consider fixed out-of-plane magnetic field, and now they change the temperature. So if you are changing the temperature, you are killing the superconducting condensate. So psi is going down. Since the psi is going down, that also the curvature is going down, which means one over the curvature is going up, and they are also seeing that, okay, inductance is going up. And still one thing I need to tell you that this is the, altogether the inductance. So this is the inductance of the current plus the inductance of the vortices. So the last thing they did, they didn't consider any vortices, so they don't apply any magnetic field. In that case, you don't have any vortices. And they again measure the inductance, and they get this curve. But what is important here? The range of this effect, or the signal, is on the level of nano, Henry. The signature of this signal is on the level of micro, Henry. So all the kinetic inductance of the, of the current and everything, you can completely ignore, because it's let's say, two orders of magnitude, if not more, smaller than that. So all this signal is really just coming from the many vortices which you have in the system, and basically they are responding to the, to the, to the driving field, and since they are carrying magnetic field, they are doing this, this response. And then they said, okay, so if I will now apply the in-plane magnetic field together, 
Then they said, okay, the effect should be even more uh, enhanced because if you have magnetism, magnetism and superconductivity does not like each other. And they said, okay, if I will have an in-plane magnetic field, I will even more kill the curvature. Not only temperature will kill it, but also the in-plane magnetic field will kill it. And it means our inductance should go up. So that was the expectation. And now comes the experimental data. Now I'm really showing you the inductance as a function of the in-plane magnetic field. So at zero in-plane magnetic field, they are having some, some, some spots. And now they are cranking in the in-plane magnetic field and they were expecting this should go up as it was before. But surprisingly, things are going down. And they are going down independently, again, depending whether the in-plane magnetic field is perpendicular to the current, oh, sorry, parallel to the current or perpendicular to the current. So we are seeing this data. And then later there is these things and then it's going up. And that was a puzzling. Okay, this is the same plot, but now they are having more data points because they changed the direction, let's say, in, uh, in some steps. And they clearly see that there is always, in both cases, the decrease of the inductance compared to the zero case. And, that was, and then there is a control sample when there is no drajba. So this is aluminum uh, gallium arsenide uh, quantum well created on that phase. There is no drajba. And basically see that, okay, inductance is going up. Okay, but sample is a little bit different, so, you know, it's not on the same order of magnitude, but they are clearly seeing that, okay, inductance is going up, no rajba. So they had the idea that the reason for that should be manifestation of the rajba interaction and the input magnetic field. But we didn't have any model for that. So microscopics, like, start with some Bogolub of the Jean equation, that the case would be really very horrible. And, okay, this is just the summary of that. So... Uh, so of, of the effect, and basically this was the way how I entered the game and say, okay, let's try to solve the ginzburg landau equations. So I take really this fundamental Hamilton, uh, free energy, including the Lifshitz term, because the Lifshitz term would be really non-zero if there is a Rajba and in-plane magnetic field. Otherwise, this term would be the zero, so which is exactly the thing which they observed. And I was able to minimize the functional and find the ground state of that. And I really showed that those coefficients, kx and ky, are really different, which really means that, okay, those things are proportional to 1 over kx and 1 over ky, if you wish. And we were able to really uh, demonstrate that, okay, this phenomenological Hamiltonian has the potential qualitatively and even quantitatively to explain the effect. So this is the fits, which, uh, of course, you get some nonlinear equations, so you are having many solutions. So I just found the solutions which were valid for the small in-plane magnetic fields. And we were really able to see that those Kx and Kys are going up, which means inductance is going down because inductance is inversely proportional to K. And uh, we somehow were able to make something like the vortex tomography out of that. So measuring inductance, we were able to transfer the data to the profile of the, of the order parameters, how the order parameters, they function, looks close to the center of the of the of the vortex so i'm just telling it as a as a things which is nice so rajba physics on some let's say uh free energy model and okay we we were lucky to to publish in physical weeks uh, uh join again experimental theory work and that's basically i just want to say okay this that this lifshitz invariant is is responsible for that and lifshitz invariant is there because we are having rajba physics so i'm coming to the conclusions so I was trying to convince you that these non-centrosymmetric superconductors are having interesting transfer properties in terms of the supercurrent diode effect or anisotropic vortex squeezing. We are able to understand superconducting diode effects from microscopic theory, but also from the phenomenological theory. These anisotropic vortex squeezings, we just have the phenomenological model, uh, and this needs to include the Lifshitz invariants. And uh, basically, yeah, I'm always advertising that uh, I have a position now in Slovakia, in Bratislava, and uh, I have a one PhD position for someone who would like to do such non-centrosymmetric superconductors and do some further studies. But that's all, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dennis. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, and we are open to questions now. Uh, Gerson, anyone in the audience? We have uh, Vernek coming. Hi, Dennis. Nice to see Hi, you. Dennis. Nice to see you. Yeah, nice talk. 
Thank you. Yeah, a lot of good stuff. Um, if I think a little bit more, I'll I'll have more than ten questions, but I'll I'll keep about just one. And um, it's a good excuse to get together so we can discuss in person at some point. Um, uh, uh, regarding the first part of your talk, where you were um, showing the diode, uh, the general for diode effect. Yes. So, so when you when you have aluminum uh, in proximity with your two dead, with a strong spin arc, I think spin arc is the uh, yes. highest energy scale. So, um, I was wondering if you, you may have like a P wave type of bearing. So, you can. So, are they important for, for this effect? If you if you increase your magnetic field, you may get rid of your S wave type, and 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 live with with Q wave. Can you can you see uh, any different your uh, Johnson current, for example? Yes, this is a very good question. Yes, uh, there are experiments which uh, basically the people looking for the Majorana fermions. They exactly considered the same thing, and they were seeing when the magnetic field is now along the current, they observe some phase transition. And this phase transition uh, corresponds to the situation. Let me just maybe find it on my slide, and I can just quickly tell you. So in this picture, I cannot do this trick. In the large magnetic field, I cannot use this trick. And basically what happened is that those two cylinders or those two circles cross each other, and then the spin texture looks completely different. So we are really thinking that for large magnetic fields, uh, basically these two concentric circles should be taken seriously. And this is also the reason why you will get a P wave coupling. Uh, if you will take it, if you will take both, 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 both circles together, you will also get a P wave coupling. And maybe this transition, when they are touching and they see in the transport that the gap is closing and reopening, and they are seeing that the Andre boundary spectra change and they compute some topological invariant for that. We think it could be really related with, with, with this thing that can be the signature of the P wave. But this is pure speculation on our side. But I think that people studying Majoranas, that they are exactly uh, seeing this in the, in the perspective you, you suggested. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry uh, that I'm speaking, but it's so. More questions? More questions? Anyone in the audience, Gerson? I guess I guess not. Not over here. Okay, uh, I have a I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, did anyone try to use uh, superconductors with a higher TC, like uh, cuprates, to study this? Uh, what is the temperature? Yes. In a scale? No. No. As I know, not. Uh, somehow you need this S wave. Uh, S wave pairing is somehow important for that. So in cuprates, oh, you would okay. have a D wave. Uh, D -wave. And okay. know that, uh, uh, I, I don't know about any experiment in the cuprates with the supercurrent diode effect, honestly. Okay, okay. So yeah. uh, it has to be S wave. A at least uh, we have a theory for the S wave, and we see okay. that S wave is able to, let's say, theory with the S wave pairing is able to explain the experimental data. We didn't try okay. D wave. But I know that the Japanese group uh, 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 around uh, uh, how it's uh, the name Naga, Nagaosa Nagaosa group. I okay. think they tried okay. also the D wave and they claim they see something. Okay. Okay. But then the profile of changing is not so simple. You know, you just apply the implant magnetic field that we see it's going up and then it's decreasing. But they are seeing some more dynamics then. Okay. And uh, the other the other question uh, is, uh, did uh, did anyone try to do the experiments applying an, an electric field to increase or decrease the uh, spin orbit interaction? Yes, and see how... it was, we, we have a data uh, that we are finishing. Uh, we are finishing the publication. They exactly do the same thing, and they okay. gate the system such that you get uh, more charge carriers, and you effectively enhance the spin orbit coupling. Okay. You clearly see that gating in a way that you enhance the spin orbit coupling is enhancing the effect. Okay. And deplete 
such that you lower the spin orbit coupling, you also quench the effect. So, so we are having uh, experimental data, which uh, will appear hopefully soon on the archive when we see this. Okay, okay. So we really think that this is the manifestation of the spin orbit coupling in two deck. Okay, exactly. So any, any questions from the virtual attendants? Yeah, uh, I have one. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so the, the conversation you had with Georgi and Vernac now made me wonder. Um, so the, the, the S wave is important because of the way it couples the Fermi surfaces of the split Rashba. Uh, uh, um, yes. Surfaces, right? Um, okay, so I, I get that, I understand. Now I wonder if you have a D wave or B wave, then it would be a matter of uh, engineering different distortions. So if you have instead of a Rashba, if you have Dressel House, or if you have other types of uh, anisotropy and distortion of the Fermi wave, from the from surface, then it could favor a different kind of superconductivity. You agree with us? There's no theory on that, I guess. I understand what you tell. Yeah, it's very interesting what you are suggesting. I don't have any calculations done for that. We didn't calculate that, but I clearly see what you are saying. Yeah, that then you are get, yeah, you are getting much more, let's say, exotic couplings or possibilities to, to distort the Fermi surface differently. And definitely what we try to do is that uh, the, the importance of the Dressel house. Dressel house has some importance. So we see the manifestation of the Dressel house also in the two deck. I didn't call, I didn't uh, show it in 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 my uh, presentation, but there is a clear experimental signature of the Dressel house. Linear Dressel house we are able to detect. Yeah, one one other interesting thing would be uh, if you were close to the persistent spin helix regime where the alpha is equal beta. Exactly. Jackson, you are reading as we exactly want to do. So we yeah. exactly want to see what, what would happen if you take the persistent uh, helix and you, you deproximatize it. You will get a more complicated uh, spin texture and the question is what it will have as an effect of that. But we don't have any preliminary Okay, thank you. So we can, Jason, if you are interested, we can uh, look for that even together. It's a great point. We really want to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a, I have a, a last question from my part. Uh, is there uh, would you expect anything interesting if you change the dimensionality of the of the uh, 2D electron gas? You go to a quantum wire, for for example, with a spin orbit interaction, and should you see anything? Should you expect anything different if you are in uh, one? We, uh, we, I can tell you that because we tried. It's important that you have several transverse channels. So, okay. uh, I really, so uh, at least in the case when we study the uh, Bogolub of the Gen, we define it with, it's really important to have that you can have a, you know, that KY, the transverse momentum plays the important role. Okay. So I would expect that if you really just would have a van, one channel, Theoretically, effect is there, but it's so weak that I would say you will not measure it. Okay. So the transverse channels are, are, are important there. Important. Okay. Okay. So, uh, any more questions? And, and, and maybe, George, still, like, if you yeah. will consider, like, the 3D samples, then the things with the screening of the magnetic field. So you apply the in-plane magnetic field, and then, okay. if, you know, if the sample is thicker, that the, 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 the magnetic screening is also then uh, causing the problems. Okay, so, like so it's uh, samples are good compromise. Okay, two D is uh, is is best. Okay. Yes. So any any questions, anyone? So if not, we should thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. I gonna be thank you very much. I gonna be writing to you soon, asking for the slides if you don't mind. Uh, to, yes, sure. Uh, post together with the video in our YouTube channel. Yes, thank you. Hopefully it was useful. I enjoy very much talking with you and discussing with you. It was a very nice talk. Thank you very thank much. You. Goodbye, guys. Okay, thank so you. nice to meet you and uh, nice thank to you. Meet very you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.